For years, this massive 300 acre toxic plume existed like some sort of sleeping giant. Sleeping giant. I mean, it's uh, it's a big plume. It's under the village. So maybe that analogy is is reasonable. The sleeping. The idea of the sleeping giant is is that yeah, that continues to grow unless there's a, a different methodology that a person discovers to fill that hole. You think by sleeping giant he means something like a time bomb, something that will go off later and w wake up and maraud the neighborhood. Possible. Certainly, uh, you would want to act as if that were true. It's more like a snake in the grass or a snake under the grass that will bite you and poison you rather than some lumbering giant. Uh, you might argue that a plant, a facility, is a sleeping giant or a plant that is still operating is a still stomping around giant. I think of the, the plume as a sort of seeping, slithering phenomenon. A spill happened and we went about our business. I never really figured that there was any cover-up going on. And uh, you know, it wasn't until later that they determined that it was coming out and percolating up through the ground into the basements of the houses. And that's when the excitement started. There was knowledge that vapor intrusion was a potential issue, but the paradigm that folks were operating under was that in order to have a significant vapor intrusion problem, you needed to have a higher concentrations of contaminants in the groundwater, in the, you know, the offsite area under the village, and they needed to be at a shallower depth. In 2002, um, we requested IBM to undertake an investigation of the vapor intrusion issue off-site. And they sampled people's houses and did in fact find um, that uh, vapor intrusion was an issue, that uh, people were being exposed to these volatile organic compounds through that pathway. There was kind of a, a recognition that, you know, that paradigm was wrong, basically. You have volatile organic compounds that leaked through the soil into the groundwater at the plant site. They want to come out of the groundwater and move into the air. The air that they move into is the, the air that's in the soil particles above the water table. Through Brownian motion, some of those molecules migrate into the air and then they migrate through the soil particles up into the vicinity of a structure, in this case somebody's house, and ultimately get sucked into or pushed into the house and people are breathing. People through their drinking water or people who are breathing air that's come up through their basements into their homes either ingest or inhale chemicals that are contained in the water and the air. And that goes through their body. That gets picked up by the, through the lungs, by the, uh, the circulatory system in the lungs or through the gut to be distributed throughout the cells in the body. And that's basically how chemicals like trichloroethylene get to cells where they might do damage to something like a Well, I think the DEC installed ventilation systems in nearly 480 homes. So that's a lot of properties. They had to vent these homes and they had to start doing it immediately because now they had a liability. IBM had a liability to the village residents of Endicott. And basically the obvious liability is we're gonna sue you beyond recognition for what you did to this village. Right up into the 70s and 80s, it was still that IBM was the do-gooder corporation that wouldn't do anything to your community. 
Uh, and I think when some of the words from, the, from these hazardous spills and the wastes and how they were getting rid of some of their byproducts came through, uh, that it, uh, it wasn't surprising that IBM tried to put a positive spin on it, you know, either to deny it or to act like it wasn't as serious as it was. To act as if, acting as if, okay, uh, acting as if everything's all right, which is kind of like that's a, uh, the foundation of that is built on sand. What provided them life, what seemed the chemical illusion of providing them life, is not killing them. The primary paradox of the process is that as the consequences begin to mount, there's an increasingly greater incentive to want to keep them buried. And the most immediate and visible consequences are the tip of the iceberg. In addition, there are all of these unconscious, spiritual, and psychic components of the disease that have often been buried for decades. The addict must reach a tipping point to either face the situation in the light of day or go on to the bitter end. I am 36 years old and I am sitting in a rehab. I catch a glimpse of myself in a mirror as if for the first time. Maybe just a sliver of myself. I remember that I had dreams. There is a line drawn in the sand that represents myself in the world again. There is a flickering hope and a small feeling that is almost a voice. A beachhead of clear thought. A window of opportunity, a passage through, but through the window, a void that threatens, even as it holds out the fleeting promise of being the truest thing that I will ever know. The hole gets bigger and bigger and bigger, unless they discover how they fill the hole. And the trouble is, we've got a society that teaches us that we fill the hole from the outside. Yeah, I worked with Nick uh, in Building 38 about six or seven years ago. Uh, uh, we worked in an operation that was nicknamed uh, a Crash and Bash. Uh, we dismantled these uh, huge mainframe uh, computers and salvaged the parts. Um, I remember Nick called it uh, creative destruction. Uh, we were both in recovery at that point. Uh, I was about 10 years in and he was about one year in. But I remember uh, a conversation that we had one day. I, I asked him, do you think, uh, your, what, what do you think your problem is? And uh, uh, he said, well, I, I drink a little too much of this and smoke a little too much of that. Well, I interrupted him and uh, said, no, the problem is you. <laughs> <laughs>